Hi, I'm Bart Weiss, director of the Dallas Video Fest. And one of the really great things about running a festival is you get to meet lots of really wonderful filmmakers, filmmakers who make great films. And um, I've been very rich in my ability to do that over the years. Um, but sometimes we have people that can't make it to our festival. And it's really important for you to get to know who these people are and the kind of films that they make. So we've been doing these Google Hangouts, and I hope you watch many of them. There are so many really fun people, and um, you get to know a lot more about the film, and it'll help you as you're trying to figure out what film to go see, because sometimes there are three films going on at once, and it's hard to make choices. So hopefully, these chats we're doing here will help you do that. Here's interesting highlights on my hair here. This makes my hair whiter than it normally would be. Uh, so the film we're gonna talk about here today is Here Comes the Video Freaks. And uh, John, you're in New York right now? Yes. Yep. Uh, in the east side, west side, uptown Brooklyn. down there? In the Brooklyn side. The Brooklyn side, oh. See, back when I lived in New York, Brooklyn was not the cool place to live, but uh, I guess it totally is now. Well, maybe, <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, maybe not my neighborhood, but I'll take it. Well, certainly the rents are a lot cheaper than they were back in, in the 70s when I when I lived there. So um, why were you interested in doing a film about video freaks? Um, I, and along with my partner, uh, we met Bart Friedman, who was one of the video freaks. No relation to me. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at a film screening about 10 years ago, a film that I made. Uh, that was being screened. Uh, what song was that? It's called Goodbye Hungary. Ah, good. And uh, it was a film about refugees in Hungary 10 years ago. Um, and Bart was in the audience, and he was just a friendly guy, and we got to chatting, and we learned that he was a filmmaker, media maker, and we asked him what his story was, and he told this amazing tale of the video freaks. Uh, and after he told us this whole story, we later Jenny and I said that, you know, sounds like a movie and we weren't sure if any of the tapes still existed. We knew one or two were still that they, one or two tapes had been copied, you know, a million times over the four decades that had since passed since the story takes place. And, um, but when we saw these tapes, uh, they just had this quality to them a uh it just seemed so present and um and this was videotape of like uh the woodstock festival and it just seemed like you were there it was just a way to see the 60s like i've never seen it before it just feels like you're in the moment and not looking back so um we decided that we would pursue uh, a film about the freaks and uh over the course of many years we uh raised money to restore tapes and uh, slowly we started doing interviews with you know one freak and then another freak and then we started to get kind of a critical mass that we thought yeah this is can be a movie because there were times when we doubted whether we had the enough footage or whether we could tell the story um, but finally we did so, so let's talk about these tapes. Um, so we're in a media world now where things are on cards, and before that there were like D, uh, mini DV and Betacam and all these other things. These tapes were half-inch reel-to-reel video. And this really gets at the beginning of where video becomes a medium of the people. Um, so like, what what are what's it like working with these tapes and getting them restored? Because like that's the most critical thing. You can't tell the story without these tapes. This is like Exhibit A. Yeah, and these tapes were not in the best of shape. Right, right. For for many years, um, you know, when the video freaks disbanded, you know, for lack of a better word, the people just. Certain people took some tapes with them, other tapes went with other people, and they just ended up in attics and basements and just kind of, they were just everywhere. And then, uh, coincidentally, around the time when we started making the film, um, the video freaks had the idea that they should probably get this stuff together, and there was some, some other people involved in that too, and 
um, Video Data Bank, which is an organization in Chicago, decided that they wanted to house the tapes. Um, but that's just part of it. So that basically got all the tapes in one place um, to be put in boxes. But as you said, these tapes were in bad shape. Not only that, the technology was long defunct. I mean, you can't find a tape player that can play one of these tapes. Uh, the formats are long gone. The, most of the machines are gone. So, But that was a start, at least. And we knew that we could read the labels and see what potentially was on the tape. Some had dates. Some labels were accurate. Some were... Uh, <laughs> Some were not accurate. Some were just goof, goofy names that they wrote in the moment. Sure, sure. So, um, These guys so that, were probably, shall we say, using controlled substances from time to time. <laughs> so labeling might not have been very neatly done as though an accountant did it. Yeah, although some were quite neatly done. But I'm sure no one ever thought, you know, 40 years in the future, somebody is going to be going through our tapes hoping to make a movie. Um, so... That was that became the next kind of fun part of production, which, which was going through these tapes, deciding, you know, once we raised money, what to uh, what to go for. And sometimes we were we knew based on uh, people's recollections, kind of what was on the tape. Sometimes we didn't. So there was a mix of, you know, we took a risk with one tape and we or or we we struck out with another cuz each tape costs around uh, $200 and up to just look at. So yeah. you can't even you can't just look at them and decide you're going to re restore them. You got to make the call. So um and we also there was some uh an organization in in San Francisco, Bay Area Video Coalition right. and they happened to get a grant from the NEA to subsidize half-inch tape restoration, so we jumped on that too. And there were a few things along the way that kind of helped subsidize our restoration. So that was important. And it was that process of discovery was really interesting and fun because we kept coming up with new things that we didn't know existed. Sure. And, and people, uh, some of the video freaks who we, you know, talked we had basically had a list of about a thousand tapes, and I would go through each video freak. I would sit down and I'd say, "Now, what is, what do you think's on this tape? What do you think's on this tape?" <laughs> and uh, and sometimes those what they thought would line up, and sometimes it wouldn't. Yeah. And uh, and then we would get stuff back, and sometimes it was stuff that we never expected. So that was kind of neat. So John, talk about the um, kind of universe back then when the video freaks started because they were not the only people doing these half inch reel to reel films and the the idea of videos because it really was at those days such a tactile difference of film and video i mean you, you were talked about about woodstock and when you talk about woodstock most people flash to the film just on a 60 millimeter film and had this vision a colorful vision of what that was and as you so well said, that the video really makes you feel like you're there in a way that the film doesn't. It, it has a very different tactile sense to it and an emotional draw to it. So, so who are the players in this world back in half-inch reel-to-reel video? Uh, in addition to the video freaks, some of the yeah. other people? Yeah. Uh, well, there were a few things happening. There was, you know, if we're talking about 1969, 1970, there's obviously... Uh, politics uh, informing a lot, a lot of people and a lot of artists. But there's also, uh, since it was such a new medium, there were artists who were just getting their hands on this, these new tools for the first time. So there were people like uh, Nam June Pike, right. who who was a contemporary of the Video Freaks and friends with friends with them. Um, and he was doing very, you know, they were and and the Video Freaks were doing that too. So. Every, a lot of people were just kind of exploring what it meant to have this new medium and what it meant uh, when all of a sudden you could take a video and play it back on a on the television set. And so we're so used to that now, but even back then... It was revolutionary. Uh, it was revolutionary. You know, a TV set is where you see the news. Right. You don't put a whole movie on television. It was just a totally new kind of thing. So, And having the immediacy as well that you yeah. go shoot something and then go on the street and show it to people. Yeah. 
and and exhibit things in a very different kind of way. Yeah. So so I mean that there were like several other groups of people sort of doing this kind yeah. of work at that time. Yeah. What made the freaks, the video freaks, different than you know guerrilla television, downtown community television, and um, and rain dance and some of the other groups. Yeah, and well, Andrew, I guess. Well, what attracted us was the story, and the story that begins at Woodstock, uh, kind of coalesces with this uh, project with for CBS, uh, and in the end ends up with the pirate television station yeah. in the Catskills. It was just such a wonderful narrative that. Uh, that's what we wanted to to tell, and and because it's an inspirational too, to us, especially nowadays. Because, um, you know, at, at at no point that I can tell were the video freaks ever expecting to get rich or make any money at all. But the, you know, make enough money to live and 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 be artistically successful. And there's and that do. one scene when they're actually talking about that, about you know, making money and not making money. Which yeah. I think is just really kind of wonderful. Yeah, and and then it was never spoken of again. <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> uh, but but by staying true to what they believed and what they want, what they wanted to accomplish, although I'm sure they couldn't have uh, necessarily um, verbalized it at the time, they created something quite wonderful. Yeah, uh, and and in a sense, it also reflected a lot of the values of the era. I mean, they start out. Um, you know, after after this sort of beginning days, and they get this deal with CBS, and they are working like in trying to work in, you know, in the world, trying to work with the man, trying to reshape the world as it's known, getting that out there, and then like it doesn't work out, and so what do they do? They move out to the country, they move out of the world, and sort of establish their own kind of universe in a new place. And, yeah. and so many people made that kind of move. They try to work in the system, and then they move kind of away. It's really, aside from the whole media part of it, it's very indicative of, of, of what that world was like back then. Yeah, yeah, and we felt that their, that their story in many ways mimicked the, the story of the counterculture uh, on a larger scale, and we thought that it was a good way to tell that story as well, not just the story of the video freaks, but what was happening in front of their lenses. Uh, as well as behind, so so that was part of what uh, informed us as we put the film together, um, because in many ways it's coming of age film, and we wanted there to be universal uh, themes and universal takeaways, and not just an artifact of of, of media history or of history at, either. So so I feel like it was successful in that way too. So um, as as a filmmaker yourself, um, how does like the people of that time and um, Skip and all of them um, going about their doing, working and not working within the system, not thinking about money. How does that sort of influence you and how do you feel watching sort of the way they deal with the possibility in the future of television? Um, you mean as an artist? How do I, how, what do I take away? And, and, and somebody who works in media, you've had things probably, yeah. you know, on television yeah. in your own kind of way, yet you make your own personal work as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that it, you know, it's always been true and, and they kind of bring it into focus somewhat that is you need to find your own way. Everybody needs to find their own way and, and there's no clear path for media makers in front of us, you know. You don't just make a movie, you don't just get a job in television, you know, it just doesn't happen. You have to um, stay true to yourself and you have to find ways to uh, to express it and to tell the stories you want to tell. And and sometimes you don't know what they're gonna what those stories are gonna be or how they're gonna be told. But um, but if you have uh, confidence, it sounds kind of cheesy, but and and you and you just Stay true to yourself. You can make wonderful things or find wonderful stories, and and uh, and I think that a lot of people could take inspiration from the video freaks and their story in that they were they were presented with tools, and they found new ways and new ideas to work with those 
you know, there were challenges, obviously, and those challenges helped shape their successes. Uh, and just today, you know, they're the same things. They're, I feel like all people are always saying, oh, look at these cameras. They're so small. <laughs> Every time they get a little bit smaller, people are like, wow, it's going to change everything. Wow, now it's this smaller. It's going to change everything. Nothing really changes. But, um, but there are all, always technological opportunities unfolding in front of us today. It's has to do with the distribution side of things and, and reaching people and and um, but even so people are discouraged um, but I think the story of the video freaks can be an inspiration to to a lot of people because here these people were in 1972 building a television transmitter mm -hmm. like from spare parts and they did it and they made a TV channel and they reached the town um, you couldn't get someone to do that today. Like nobody could would dream of it. Um, but there's all these other opportunities out there. Um, so uh, there is like this whole low power radio thing that's going on. People are sort of taking that idea of broadcasting out to their communities in in a way to sort of subvert the traditional broadcast model. Yeah. Um, so what would you say, like you've watched probably more half inch reel to reel video than any human, probably more, probably more than they did when they were yeah. living. Yeah. Um, so what would you say is like the aesthetic of that era? What was a good tape? What are the things that half inch reel to reel brought that like traditional media can do that, you know, our beautiful digital SLRs or 4K cameras or whatever we have, it, like what is special about the look of that half inch reel to reel? And what were, what was the language of a tape that was a good tape? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, the video freaks have their own specific definitions of a good tape, but my, what I think is good about some of this stuff is that, you know, at the time, um, the prevailing um, aesthetic was that of film, 16 millimeter film, and, and montage and editing. And when you are shooting on 16 millimeter film, you decide what your shot's gonna be and what your next shot's gonna be. But when they picked up the video cameras, they weren't thinking about what the next shot's gonna be or, or if they'll ever edit it, because at that time, editing was quite difficult, actually. So, um, but there was, so there was an approach when they picked up the camera of experiencing life in a different way. And it was really, um, they didn't know what was going to happen and they just experienced with the camera. And, and that comes through in the tapes. So the tapes where they're really just experiencing life, um, has a, has a, a quality to it. That's unlike film. And nowadays, with editing um, technology, it's very cheap and easy. I feel like some of that's lost, yeah. other than like live streaming and stuff. But there's a little bit of that lost in filmmaking. There's a, you know, a lot of documentaries today are beautiful, composed, you know, edited beautifully. But there's a little life that's missing, you know, to a lot of stuff. Um, you, there's not as much of the feeling of just like being in the streets and where are we going to go with this tape and what's going to happen. And I think that's what's so fresh about that stuff. When you look back and you see this stuff in the late sixties, Woodstock and, um, some of these marches and protests, because we in the two thousands and the nineties and, um, the 60s are, are, are presented in a very specific way by media, right? The Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and then the hippie, and then it's like, that's it. That's the 60s. But there are sights and sounds and feelings that um, are true that come across in these videotapes that are um, eye-opening and special. And I think th that's what makes a good tape. So, uh, in, indeed, that is true. There is this sense of this live feeling that is that is less manipulated than than what we're used to and 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 truly gives you a like you were there notion and and often the art is in the like just like being there in the observing and sort of yeah. being in that moment with them so for them what would they say a good tape is um well the um 
they they were conscious of this effect too, and there was a there was a presence of the maker that made a good tape. You know, the the uh, the sense of the person behind the camera getting in the mix, talking, fooling around. Skip is great at that. Yeah, yeah, and and so if the if you I feel the maker, it. you feel a little spontaneity, you feel the spontaneity, and then something strange happens. I mean, that's a good tape. Yeah. Yeah, so so we're trying always to find something strange happening. So um, in in going through the film, you sort of had this sort of outline of the story from Bard at the beginning. Yeah. Um, um, what sort of how did your expression, your understanding of that story change as you start to talk to some of the other freaks? Um, well, the framework that was originally presented that night in the bar. Yeah. That we were, you know, um, that Jenny and I were so excited about, basically held true to a certain extent, and um, and then when we, you know, learned about all the, the all the players, you know, met them all and kind of got the story. You know, it's nobody's story; it's a group, um, and a group doesn't is ten, eleven individual people and they have different recollections so they all speak they all speak for themselves so but the the framework was there but there were you know there's relationships there's um uh that come and go and and make up part of it there's the family aspect that we didn't really necessarily see mm -hmm. um you know, the collective uh, process is really nice and interesting and kind of see how that takes shape. And, so, and that, that collective process is totally, I mean, if you want to understand what that era was like, all that stuff about what a collective is and how you organize and it's disorganized, but we do some, but we're still around. I mean, that totally fit what that world was like back then. And a yeah. real microcosm of many groups on the left of trying to get together and do and be a collective because there was a lot of those collectivisms. Yeah, and there's not really any these days. I mean, there are maybe there are some, I'm sure, and, and a few media collectives, but not like there were. There's a lot of auteurs, right? Not a lot of uh, less collaboration, probably. Well, there was one sort of very loosely in Seattle um, during the WTO thing a few uh -huh. years ago, right? Got to get, I mean, that's as close knit of a thing, but those people got together, did one event, tried to do a few others, and yeah. somewhat disbanded. But this was really a kind of a movement and um, an interesting movement that really, I think, gen you know, influenced a generation of, of, of filmmakers. And then some of these people just went in different kind of directions. So um, do you want to sort of go into where some of these people are now? Sure. Um, Skip Blumberg is a video artist, working video artist, has been for, for decades. Um, Perry Teasdale is... Before we leave from Skip, the last I saw Skip, he had a teaching job that was, I don't know if it was going well or not, he wanted to do things his way and the school wasn't happy about him. Does he still have a teaching job? Um, well, he's always a teacher, but I don't know if he has... <laughs> uh, I couldn't say, but I'm pretty sure he's not. Uh, I saw him this weekend in Boston. He came to see the film for the first time just two days ago. Uh, so that was exciting. Did what did he, he say? Gave, he liked it. He liked it. <laughs> I mean, he's seen cuts all the way, all the way through. But you know, that's another thing. It's when you're telling someone's story. Mm. You know how I can't imagine how difficult that must be to see your story, your tapes told, and uh, it's not just us, but it's the other members of the group. Everyone's kind of putting in their own two cents of how they felt everything went down and, and obviously we're trying to make a entertaining movie at the same time. So, yeah. so there's always, that's an interesting, that's been an interesting process all along the way. And these are media makers. So, but it's been great. It's yeah. been great. And it's, and, um, and it was great to have Skip finally get a chance to see it this past weekend. Um, let's see. Um, uh, David Court, uh, was a media maker for for decades. He's he's not doing so great health wise these days, but he you know got into computers and 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 uh, new media just as you can imagine. I mean, overall, people. What's a, what's great about the video freaks 
as a group is that they basically stayed true to themselves their whole lives. And here we are, um, you know, making a film about young people when these young people are no longer young. Um, yeah. which is kind of interesting, but, but, um, uh, Let's see, I'll just to name a few others. Nancy Kane um, was a media maker, video maker, her whole career um, working in and out of public access and the idea of, of democratizing media. That was her thing all along. Bart Friedman, who we met that day up in Woodstock, or in Socrates, rather, um, has been in community media the whole ever since, uh, ever since Lanesville TV, um, Perry Teasdale um, uh, is a newspaper editor and publisher in um, upstate New York. Um, Carol von Tobel became a social worker, um, and Woodward uh, became a video editor. Had a career as a video editor, and then a second career as a nurse. Mm. Um, Chuck Kennedy, who has since passed, he was the technical guru of the video freaks. He built the transmitter. Yeah. Um, he wa became a teacher or uh, at New Paltz mm. in their video department. And earlier this year, when there was a big show uh, about the video freaks' work at SUNY New Paltz, they went into the vault and they found all this video freaks equipment yeah. <laughs> that had been basically there when Chuck worked there. And a lot of the stuff actually ended up in the equipment closet in New Paltz. Does any of it still work? You know, I don't know if they plugged it in. But they presented it like there was a museum piece. We put it on like a pedestal. It was great. Um, you know, it would be really interesting to, for somebody to try to use those cameras again. I mean, they, they had such interesting properties to them. And, you know, editing was such a difficult nightmare. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. If you, you saw anybody edit, but you had to take one reel and move it like two and a half here and then, you know, two back here and turn them both on, turn, hit five and then hit the edit. Yeah. It, it might. Oh, that'd be great. That's a great exercise. You could get a couple of porta packs and, a, and an editing thing and you could tell people that that's what they have to. Uh, right. You have to, everybody that's has to go shoot a video with a porta pack and make something great. And, and, and indeed, that's why the aesthetic. Of, of long takes happen because the process of going through and editing that material was just very difficult and um, you know you couldn't go back if you've gone far and completely rework a sequence because of the way the editing system was or if you did you had to change up something else it was just very hard um, and so so the manipulation came at the moment of shooting really mostly yeah yeah and, I think you're right and 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 then there were just these other kind of proc amps and other kind of crazy things one had to do to get this all to work. Um, and then, as you were talking about, getting these preserved is just a nightmare because the tapes are in bad shape and there are very few decks left. And uh, yeah, yeah, and 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 there's a there is a, a process. You you take one of these tapes and you actually put it in an oven. Yeah, uh, a very low temperature oven for maybe a few days. <laughs> It's crazy, and then you run it through, and right. Uh, you you but, bake the tape, and you get one shot at playing yeah. it. And after that, yeah. it's it's done. Yeah. Uh, somebody once told me that they put them in pizza ovens. Um, I think it's like that, or like a dehydrator, uh, where you make like beef jerky. I'm not really sure what they do, but there's definitely an oven component. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I'm really grateful that this work still lives on, and that people are getting a chance to understand like the story of how these 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 films are made. Um, for us to run a video festival, and um, to me, we started this when video was very different from film. Um, the idea of what it is, the sort of aesthetic that all of our core values come from about the meaning of work and that work should deal with a sense of community, it should deal with issues, um, really comes from the work of, of video freaks and their brethren and all the you know, sort of groups around them. And so seeing this film really sort of ties you in to a feeling of what it was like back then and understanding who these people were. And, and were it not for this film, nobody would know this history. 
and except for the people who lived it, we're all going to die off soon. So yeah. you know, yeah. I truly appreciate you taking the time to raise the money, which is not an easy thing to do, yeah. Yeah. and and stay with a project. I'm sure there were at least 10 times along the way where you thought like, do I really want to keep doing this? Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, because there are so many moments of, of de you know, depression and whatever. Yeah. Um, but to, to go through to the end and to, you know, have these people, these what were essentially outsiders coming together to help try to reinvent television for a new generation. I think it's a really important and wonderful thing. Thanks. So thank you so much uh, for making the film and letting us show it here at our festival and, and giving the people in Dallas, Texas, an opportunity to, um, to learn this history and a chance to talk to you about it as well. Great. I appreciate it. Oh, so let me ask you one other thing. This is something I just started. So um, I'm going to be doing soon a podcast about documentary films. And one of the things I'm going to be doing is asking people, how do you define a documentary? From a, just in general, how any, do you define a documentary? Way, any way you want to take it. Not an easy question. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Uh, I guess if you're just trying to communicate what's real without going in, without complicating it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, documentaries do get complicated. Yeah. But at their heart, it deals with something that's real. Yeah. Cool. Like that a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank spending you. time with us. And uh, thank you so much for making this film. Thanks uh, for programming it. This this work is very, very important to me and very fond to me, and that it's saved, preserved, and showcased in a way where you understand the context really means a lot. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mark. <laughs>